I don't think so. Uh, just about everything else, though, there is. In this valley rope, there's quite an love for one like me. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for one like me. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to change some way and he grew. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, in, in this very room, and in this very started. Here's our prelude. Please feel free to sing along as we recognize the spirit that you brought with you to church this morning. church. 
We are grateful to be together on World Communion Sunday. And we have Reverend Tom kind of preaching. Even better, we are a people of extravagant welcome, and we love to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And Donald, if you can move your microphone over to that speaker, that would be helpful for the land acknowledgement. And um, we're going to be learning a little bit more about the Tachiyoku's people, who also have a relationship with Mount D, which is right about here, but their ancestral lands are to the east of Mount D. Tachi Yokuts people over in this area, and that's who we're learning a little bit about today. It was once one of the largest Indian tribes in all of North America, right here in the Central Valley. But the entire Yokut tribe was nearly wiped out with the destruction of Tulare Lake. Tulare Lake is now farmland, but if the 1,000 square foot mile lake was here today, Kettleman City and Lemoore would be lakefront communities. The town of Alpaw would be an island, and Corcoran would be underwater. Tonight, Action News anchor Gene Higginson shows us why the lake's disappearance led to the near extinction of the Yoka Indians. The Yoka people lived along the shores of Tulare Lake for at least 2,000 years. In their story of creation, they believe the mountains on each side of the lake, the Sierra and the Coast Range, were scooped from the mud of the lake bottom. Its waters were the source of all life, the abundant plants and wildlife they lived on. Rob Hansen is a professor at College of the Sequoias and an expert on the lake and its history. If you wanted to pick a group of Native Americans that had the, the highest density population because there was so much reliable food from year to year that they didn't have to even go to war with one another, they, you know, they lived in a naturally rich area, it was Central California. There were more yokuts in, you know, in compact communities, villages, than in any other Native American group anywhere. The Yokut population around the lake in 1800 was estimated to be around 20,000 people. This educational film made back in the 1960s had Yokuts reenact some of the customs of their ancestors. They used the reeds or tules that surrounded the lake for everything from baskets to houses to the canoes they used to travel the huge lake. For most of us that's just really hard to imagine that there was a lake that was roughly 30 miles east and west, you know, sitting out here in the middle of the valley. It just, it was very, very huge, huge but shallow. But in the 1850s, farmers descended on the fertile Central Valley, diverting its rivers, the Kern, the Kawea, the Thule, and the Kings, to irrigate their crops. In 60 years, the shallow lake was gone, and so were the Indians who stood in the way. In 1853, the governor declared extermination of all Digger Indians in the state of California. The first governor of California, Peter Burnett, did issue an order for the extermination of all Native Americans in the state. Over the years, the bounty on Indian scalps was raised from 25 cents each to five dollars each. Indian men, women, and children were hunted down like animals in the valley and the foothills. The bounty, along with disease and famine caused by the loss of the lake and surrounding natural habitat, decimated the Yokuts. By 1880, a population of 20,000 had dwindled to just 600. Really? Raymond Jeff is the historian for the Tachiyoka tribe, survivors of the Yokuts who once lived along Tulare Lake. He says the tragedy of his people is one of the greatest untold stories in California history. Just like the Jews on their, their Holocaust and the Armenians in their Holocaust, right here in California from 1853 till 1903, why don't they teach that in school? Tulare Lake is now dry, home to some of the world's biggest cotton fields, subsidized and protected by the federal government with an elaborate multi-million dollar flood control system aimed at keeping water out of the natural lake. But it doesn't always work. Tulare Lake has never reappeared in its full size, although it's been pretty full on a few occasions. In the late 1930s, floodwaters forced the return of Tulare Lake. It lasted through the duration of World War II long enough for pelicans to nest along the lake shore again. Floods in the early 80s revived the lake again and destroyed the cotton crop. To stop that from happening again, during the latest spring floods, the Army Corps of Engineers diverted heavy runoff that would have flowed into the lake bed north into the San Joaquin River, causing flooding and raising questions about the logic of keeping water out of a natural lake bed. I've never even seen the lake. All I did was read about it. Meantime, the Yokut population is on the rebound. In recent years, they've developed a casino, and reed houses have given way to modern subdivisions. 
but the lake has lived on in their legends. The song sung in this nearly 50-year-old film is about the lake. They're telling the lake, you can do anything you want with me, but I'm right here. This is my, my home. In Kings County, Gene Higginson, ABC 30 Action News. And that lake came back this last year with the atmospheric river for a little while before it uh, dissipated again. Boy, we're running out of chairs here. Good, good problem today. We may need to add a couple more chairs over here. We would just grab a few more and even create a third row or just a little bit more on the sides. Um, and so as we recognize our cousins who live to the east, let us recognize that they are still in a, uh, an amazing people that are still there and still living uh, out their lives and um, are still the protectors of those lands and the ancestry of that lake. Our announcements came in an email and they look like this. And um, a couple things to note, next week is blessings of the animals. And so if you have uh, pets that you wanna bring to be blessed, we'll do it right in here. And um, if, if they don't do well with others, you can just bring a picture, especially if your cats. Don't stress out your cats by bringing them into a room with a lot of dogs. Um, but if you have pictures of your spiders and lizards and snakes and other things, um, Donald will bless the snakes, but not me. No, no. No? No. Okay, well, I don't have Pastor Christy to put it snakes. off to anymore. So... Um, Blessing of the animals next week. So maybe think about uh, um, bringing pictures. Today after church, we're having, um, you want to talk about it, Elaine? I'd love to. Is it coming through? Is it on? It sounds like it's barely on. Why don't you use this one instead? Uh, most of you know that on the 27th of September, our pastor got a little bit older. 56. <laughs> One of our younger members, I might add. <laughs> um, so today, in addition, October 8th is uh, the annual Pastor Appreciation Sunday. But we decided to combine both those celebrations into one. Um, and we're doing it today at fellowship time. So after the service is complete, um, grab a treat and come back over here and we're going to honor our pastor in a really unique way, and I would like for you to be a part of it. Um, those of you who want to contribute to the um, structure, it's in the kitchen, along with equipment to attach, whatever it is you've got con to that contribute. That sounds very vague. <laughs> <laughs> um, so please feel free if you need to go into the kitchen to take care of that. It is on the counter of right next to the window there, so you can participate in that um, and I guess that's about it the the structure is really getting full so thank you for your participation all right sounds like a conspiracy to me we have birthdays Reverend Gail Doring and Serenity Diggs uh, Reverend Gail is uh, since she's no longer at Clayton Valley she's actually a Presbytery exec in the Midwest and uh, working with Presbyteries over there and so let's sing to Serenity and Reverend Gail Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday everybody, happy birthday to you. Our Universal Christ uh, study will continue on Tuesday. This week is three chapters because they're a little shorter, chapters 8 through 10. And uh, our um, happy hour social hour, Wednesday at 4, is our chance to check in with each other in the church at home. And next Sunday evening is the I4C Interfaith Council's annual meeting, celebration, and silent auction. This year it's at Beth Heim Congregation in Danville. The potluck portion will be outdoors under their sukkah, because Sukkot starts today as well. And so they'll be doing a lot of their Sukkot celebrations, and uh, you won't want to miss that. There is some information in the announcements about that. Debbie's going to tell us more about our denominational offerings.
morning. Um, as you know, oh, I didn't wait for the reply, sorry. <laughs> we'll try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I love that. Um, we have our um, peace and global uh, special offering that uh, will be taken today. Um, however, you can still give next week or the week after, if that would be fine. Also, we are taking for the U uh, UCC uh, Neighbors in Need, Behold, that is their peace offering, and so we'll be accepting that today. And just as a note, um, we are celebrating actually 40 years for the Presbytery for the Peace and Global offering. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. God of our lives, your word is one of communion, not division. Your gifts are gifts of abundance, peace, and freedom, not scarcity, violence, and oppression. We thank you that in Christ you have given us greatest gift. You gave us yourself. As we gather today, may your gifts, your presence be received with joy and humility. Amen. Amen. Remembering our ancestors. This morning I pay tribute to my mom and dad, Alan and Sanford Cundiff. They gave me the gift of life. They also gave me another very special gift, the gift of church. I never had a chance to get to know my grandparents, but I know that they gave my parents, Alan and Sanford, a special gift as well, and that is the gift of church. Because it's pretty obvious they knew in their hearts they needed to pass that on to their children. I know this gift of church because I was baptized at birth, at, right after birth at the First Presbyterian Church of Cheyenne, Wyoming. I was confirmed at the First Presbyterian Church of Aurora, Colorado, a church that also sponsored me as a candidate for ministry and participated in my ordination in 1977 as a minister of word and sacrament that led to my serving churches in Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, I'm trying to remember, Michigan. <laughs> 28 years in Michigan prior to my retirement. So my ancestor remembrance, mom and dad always alive in my heart, giving me the precious gift of church that I hope and pray to pass on to my family. Amen. As we remember our ancestors today and pour libations for them, we, um, I'm thinking of my great aunt Dorothy who played the piano at First Pres Aurora, okay. Colorado. And she le learned piano from my great grandma Ruth um, from the Brandstein clan. So who is it that you, um, that brought you to church for the first time? Say those names. Grandma Bertha, Grandma Winnie, Betty and Pat. Grandma Ruth, all my great aunts. All my great uncles. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Those names known and those names unknown. Ashe. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. C 
sing with us, please. Good morning, church. Good morning. Join me now as we do the call to worship. Please rise. Please rise. In the midst of a world where people hunger and thirst, come worship a God who feeds the hungry. In the midst of a world where people are abused and oppressed, Come worship a God who calls for compassion and justice. In the midst of a world filled with wars and rumors of wars. Come worship a God who desires peace for the world. In the midst of a world where love is not freely shown, forgiveness is hard to find. Come worship a God whose grace and love knows no end. Amen. Amen. Rainbow. 
for the fields scattered and grown gathered for one for all one bread one body one Lord of all one cup of blessing which we Join me now as we all say the unison prayer. Join, please join me as we pray together. Loving God, through your goodness, we are able to gather around the community table. May your blessed time together so we may celebrate the gifts of bread and juice which earth has given and human hands have made. May we know your presence in the sharing of the gifts of communion, so we may recognize your presence in all creation. Amen. Amen. The peace of the earth be with you, the peace of the heavens too. The peace of the rivers be with you, the peace of the oceans too. Deep peace, deep peace falling over you. God's peace. The energy that flows through Jesus to us is an active is an active peace of Christ. As you reach out, may this peace of Christ be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. Peace. Namaste. Please be seated. All right. It's time for our prayer. That's great. So we just added one more name to that family this last week, oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> Deb Burton. Uh, Ignacio Valley Presbyterian Church, where my uh, friend Steve Hong is the pastor, and uh, Congregational Church UCC Campbell. Um, Steve Hong at um, Ignacio Valley and our friend uh, Reverend Leslie Taylor at First Christian Church were part of an important um, uh, rally outside of Concord City Hall this week 
Um, they're passing some of the, um, uh, uh, um, the policies to help protect renters that we were talking about last week. Um, and they've been working for seven years in Concord to get those protections because there's been so much racially and immigration-centered um, displacement and people uh, getting kicked out of their homes. Uh, and their rents even increased like uh, $200 uh, to $800 at a time. And then um, Merdell went up and saw uh, Mary, and did you schedule to see uh, Matt and Tristan, or they just happened to be visiting at the same time? That's amazing. And they live up close to there, right? Lincoln. <coughs> so um, there's our friends, Matt and Tristan, uh, that live up in Lincoln now, able to visit Mary too. So what a blessed picture. Thanks for sharing that. Let's check in with the church at home and see how they're doing. Who do we have there? So today we have Ann Custer, uh, Ellen Grisette, Hi there. Donna Henry, how are you? Judy Hartz, and Chuck Divo. Um, did you want to say something, Ann? Yes. Prayers of healing for Janice Campbell. Ann says prayers of healing for Janice Campbell. Janice was in and out of ICU this week. Jim said that she's on the mend, but still needs a lot of prayers. And prayers for Judy Moore as well. Lord, in your mercy. Our prayers. Anyone else online? I don't hear any more. So. Okay. Hey, Betty. My husband finally made it to church today. Well, good to see you. How are you feeling? So much. Feel good. Yeah, okay. But he's getting there day by day. Day by day, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Other joys and concerns? Hey, Bob. I'm happy my son Jeremy is here to join me in church today from Los Angeles. A professional musician, we should say. Uh, we're, he's up here because we're celebrating my grandson Jude's fifth birth or fourth birthday today and uh, it's going to be a special day for for us good lord in your grace yeah. we'll get there um happy to let you know dina and i are traveling to the philippines for six weeks we are leaving on october 6th coming back no november 18th to uh, bless our new house that's new, newly built. Also uh, meet the UCCP uh, or United Church of Christ, the Philippines members there. They're like over a hundred. Um, and also visit our relatives and some places that we have never been visited. And so the denomination there, the UCCP, is related to both of our denominations, both the UCC and the Presbyterian Church in the Philippines. Lord, in your grace, safe travels to you. In addition to being thrilled that Tom is still able to preach and get a sermon put together, and thank you to Will for asking him, I want to uh, welcome our family, our daughter Emily, grandson Thomas, and our son-in-law Ken. So, Welcome. And thanks, Will. We're excited to hear the message today. Lord, in your grace. Yeah. Hey, Briandy, how are you today? Hey, how's everybody? I am so excited because next Sunday I won't be here because I'll be in San Francisco for the matinee of the Soul Train musical. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my sterling silver hoop earrings from the 90s and all of my good uh, Soul Train clothes. All right. <laughs> we'll have to send her picture. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to send a picture. Lord, in your grace. In your grace. Yeah, Donald, go ahead. Yes, I have some prayers. Um, yes, I do you have some prayers. By the way, that is a fabulous show you are going to. It is fabulous. Um, yeah, I have my next infusion coming Tuesday for my ulcerative colitis, and so far, so good. Um, 
also, um, I just want you guys to pray for me and my sisters. Um, as many of you know, many of you don't know, we did not grow up. Well, we grew up in a very, a home filled with chaos and a lot of abuse. And um, it's affected us very differently in a lot of different ways. Um, but at support group, I said something that I never thought I would say is I came to a place of acceptance of it all. And I pray that they get there as well. And especially my sisters, um, that God would just pour into their lives and just get them out of whatever bonded, emotional bondage that they're in. So pray for all of us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Let's pray together. Gracious God, for the traveling mercies and the healing and for our sister Mary and for Bill and so many that continue to have ongoing health issues. You, you know our prayers before we can even form them in our minds, let alone put them on our tongues. So continue to pray through us for a, a world that comes together to be able to meet the real needs of each other. It's so heartening, oh God, to see so many people able to organize for themselves, to see some successes as the screenwriters have had, to be able to get the living wages that they need and the protection of their income. We pray for those that are uh, preparing to strike for teachers and for others that feel as if they've been left behind by an economy that continues to pay the rich while leaving the middle and lower classes behind. And especially in this time of economic fear and rises of inflation and so much else going on, oh God, give us a, a sense where we can care for each other and be in solidarity with each other and um, and celebrate the small wins that we get, but also recognize that we have a long way to go to be able to correct the systems that continue to make people poor and keep people poor. Oh God, you put it on our hearts to follow the ways of your son Jesus, and so continue to help us be your hands and voices in the world, your, your voice of compassion and caring and kindness in a world that, is, that has become so brutal these days. Help us to be your peacemakers, especially in this season of peace as we celebrate that in our giving and in our services today. As we see so many cranes around us, as we see even the expression of handmade prayers in these cranes continue to help us be a part of those larger movements in the world that can bring peace for folks around the world. We continue to pray for Ukraine. We continue to pray for Palestine and all of those places that continue to be left behind. Um, continue to challenge us with this radical prayer, even when we pray with very traditional language, as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in ways of eternal life. Through, through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven, amen. Amen. Please rise as we sing this song that still might be new to some of us, but there's a version in the back of your bulletin if you need it. Uh, to follow along with the music, but we'll learn it again.
shout and sing with joy, we pray God's all-inclusive love. We are the church alive, our faith has set us free. No more enslaved by guilt and shame, we live our liberty. Be seated. The readings from Ephesians 6 from the NRSV version, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on the evil day and having prevailed against everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and belt your waist with truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness and lace up the sandals in preparation for the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is a word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. All creation is the word of God. All creation speaks volumes of God. Thank you. In our scripture, Paul is writing from a prison in Rome so that with the shield of faith in hand we can do the hard work of withstanding evil that has infiltrated heavenly places. And that's world, on, on this World Communion Sunday, we recognize there is evil in sacred places sacred places all around the world and in this community. One verse that stands out in this particular translation, as shoes for your feet, feet put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. That word proclaim I found in different translations, proclaim. Proclaim and I just lost my word. <laughs> I'll get back to that. It's a tough place in our lives. 
I'm trying to proclaim. The word I was looking for is promote. Preach. Peace. In a violent world, knowing millions of souls are hungry, suffering, oppressed, people are dying. People searching for God's presence, God's embrace, God's love, God's security. It's God's peace. Well, some years ago, when doing children's messages, remember those days? <laughs> and church kids would come to church. Well, I would occasionally give the children a bag. This one happens to be from the Calvary Presbyterian Church, San Francisco. But I would give the children a bag and ask them to place something in that bag, an object of some kind, and bring it back to me the next Sunday so that I could then open that bag, be surprised with whatever is in that bag, and, and my challenge was then to find God at whatever that child might place in that bag. It was finally called Stump the Pastor Sunday. <laughs> Recall a flashlight, a candle. Hmm, a colander, hmm, a fan, a pencil, scissors, stethoscope, postage stamp, and I think there's one in here. A shoe. Hmm. By the way, I don't have the one that goes with it to put on my own feet for health reasons. I am not wearing shoes today. A shoe. I guess I'd ask the children to go out into the congregation and, and look at all the shoes. I think I go glancing at the shoes. Old shoes, new shoes, comfortable shoes, casual shoes, weird looking shoes, maybe some slippers, scuffed shoes, swanky shoes, stilettos, moccasins, tennis shoes, pumps, flats. That God is in all the shoes. Because I'm assuming, affirming that God is with us all, in us all, created in the image of God. Just God has to be in our shoes. Recognizing there are some cultures where people don't always wear shoes or moccasins, particularly in warm southern climates, going barefoot is preferred. But I discovered, oh, I've got to place the shoe back here for a moment. I discovered in the Islamic world there are well-defined manners and methods for doing a host of things. So in a book called a Suhi Bukhari, am I pronouncing that correctly? Well-defined manners and methods for putting on the right shoe first and then the left, one of those rules, one of those methods. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Right foot, right shoe first, then the left. Taking them off, starting with the left shoe and then the right so that the right shoe is always first and the left shoe always last. It's got me thinking about any rituals we might have with shoes. And one that really comes to mind is the taking off the shoes before we come into the house, mostly because we don't want to trek in a bunch of dirt. Of course, that dirt on the bottom of the shoe is something in many cultures looked at religious purposes. 
symbolizing things we need to leave outside of our homes when entering our homes, anything that might be unclean. Lots of rituals. I was watching the, I think it was Nebraska-Michigan game yesterday, and all of a sudden I saw these people in the stands holding up the shoes. It was simply an action of support for their team. What about hitting somebody with a shoe? December of 2008, there was a, a shoeing incident when an Iraqi journalist threw both shoes at President George W. Bush and protest of his policies while this landed this journalist in jail for nine months. An act of protest and using his shoes. Regardless what our cultural riches might be, we can affirm created in the image of God there is a soul in every shoe. Excuse the pun. we put on the right shoe or the left shoe first, what is really important are contemplating the charge that Paul gives us. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim, to pro preach, to promote your lives, the gospel of peace. I recently rewatched a thought-provoking rather disturbing movie, Till. A movie about the needless, violent murder of a 14-year-old African-American boy named Emmett Lewis Till, nicknamed Bo. This was in 1955. The first part of this movie was when young Emmett was preparing to, to travel from Chicago to visit his cousins down south uh, in a small town called Money, Mississippi. Population 400. And Emmett, he was excited about this traveling south to visit his cousins, uh, filled with exuberant joy in preparing for this trip. Uh, had a new shirt and a necktie and a billfold, a hat and, and the movie depiction of his life, wingtip shoes. For me, all the love of God, the innocence and joy were to be found in those shoes. Because Emmett was enjoying his visit with his cousins in Mississippi. He'd heard all the warnings about traveling south in 1955 and was prepared to be cautious, but wasn't cautious enough, I guess. He, there was an incident in a store the racial hatred of a clerk and this clerk's brother and this friend of his brother, something that was common in the 50s and in the abduction of Emmett Till, his torture, lynching, he's only 14 years old. The Reverend Dr. William Barber called the death of Emmett Till one of the most heinous hate crimes in American history, an icon of injustice, creating a mass movement that calls us to the cause of justice today. Our continuing to promote finding justice for, for women and men and children all around the world who continue today to suffer the consequences of hate-filled racism. The scripture that's worth repeating, as shoes for your feet put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Now I share this story of Emmett Till for three reasons. First, the violent murder of Emmett points us toward all that is evil, all that is broken in this world, and this part of the world that, that we call the United States. We cannot forget we are part of this whole big wide world we are praying for today. We and our lives in this community are part of this world. Because we are seeing in, and around us in our communities way too many children 
suffering, dying. There's way too much poverty and hunger, disease, violence, and needless shootings. That gun violence in 2022 took the lives of 28,000 souls in this country, with projections this year to surpass 38,000. Firearms, according to the CDC, are the number one cause of death of children in this country. Firearms, shootings, the number one cause of death. We live in this part of a world with social concerns, infecting our nation. There are hate crimes, white supremacy. Well, I guess it's the beginning of a long, long, long list of malignant, cancerous issues that create distrust, bedlam, chaos. And the question of hate. I confess, I personally confess before you today, it's hard to love some people. People I recognize that I don't fully understand. You know the phrase, hate the sin, not the sinner. Well, sometimes I feel like I'm hating the sinner. God forgive me. It's hard to see God in the shoes of people who do monstrous things and people we may never in our lives fully understand. So God forgive me when I cannot in your peace find God in all the shoes. Yet God I must pray and try to move forward in my life and promoting in this morning with you preaching peace. Second point, the story of Emmett Till for me is more about his life than his abduction, his death. I would look at the picture of this 14 year old Emmett and his new shoes purchased prior to this trip down to Money, Mississippi, and shoes that symbolize the exuberant joy we wish for all God's children. Every time I see a child playing and laughing, I, I see the love and joy and hope and peace we want for all God's children, wherever they are, anywhere in this world. Peace we are called to promote, to pass on to future generations. Emmett Till, we want his story, the good part of his life, to infiltrate our hearts. Understanding that he did die at an early age. But I want to remember the 14 wonderful, glorious years he gave this earth. Reminding what we must search for in our love, lives, the love the joy, the sacred embrace of God and what this young boy experienced. It exemplifies in a symbolic way what we pray for and pass on in our prayers, in our actions to all God's children around the world. For Emmett Lewis Till still speaks to us the need to fight for justice and peace. Because God isn't about clenched fists or frowns or tears. Hate. It's the spontaneous laughter. The smiles with open hands and arms at full stomachs, safe homes, safe schools and streets. These are all the things of peace God wants for all children all around the world. Which leads to a third point. 
and promoting and preaching and proclaiming peace, we cannot be, be complacent. We cannot allow ourselves to be inured, inured to numb or numbed or anesthetized to the reality of violence in our world, in our community, even in some Working for love, filled justice, and sustained peace is our calling, our mission. Emma Till's mother, Mamie, fought this fight of peace throughout her life. She invested her life in fighting, according to one author, Timothy Tyson, fighting the wave of terrorism that continues to take the lives of innocent children around the world. Mamie's voice needs to be combined with our voices today through our peacemaking efforts so that children like her son Emma don't have to suffer or die prematurely. That's why we support the promotion of the gospel of peace in various ministries of this church. It's important that we find ways to support the care team of this church, the outreach committee, special offerings, as we've heard earlier, as is one way. Final challenge. My final challenge is tomorrow morning when you put on your shoes. I don't really care if you put on the right shoe first or the left. That's up to you. But think about your shoes when you put them on. Think of just tomorrow morning. Let me take a moment to intentionally, consciously think about God's call for us to walk in sharing, promoting, and preaching God's peace to all God's children. I wasn't going to say this, but we'll you put on your shoes in the morning. I think it's part of your DNA. That peace is in your shoes already through your ministry. And I know that's true for many, if not all of you. That peace is already in there in, the, in your walking forward with God in your shoes. But the invitation is to consciously take a moment to reflect on what you're going to do throughout the day, Maybe starting with that putting on your shoes. I mentioned that uh, I had two ways I was going to end this message this morning, and I'm still kind of debating which one I'll use. Hmm. A or B? Well, the option B, A was going to be singing, Let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. <clears throat> but in a few moments we will be singing, and I'll be joining with the choir at singing a song in this very room. But in conclusion of this sermon, it's not in this very room, it's in, in this very shoe. There's enough love and joy and hope and peace For all the world, in this very shoe there's joy and love and peace for all the world. In this very room, in our hearts, in our lives, our shoes, God's peace. Amen. Reverend Tom, I, I saw a thing on Facebook this week that um, that Coco, the gorilla, met a Presbyterian minister named um, Mr. Rogers, hmm. and that he learned um, like 2,000 sign language wow. images uh, in his life, 
but he used to love to watch Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Rogers came to visit him one day, and Coco took off his shoes. Wow. <laughs> wow. During this time of hybrid worship, as we cannot pass the plates to offer our gifts, please place your offerings in the plates upon the table here during our offertory or closing hymn. Or you can place your offerings in the plates on the back table on your way out. If you cannot give in person, we ask that you send all of your offerings online or by mail to Merdell Dibthal, whose address is in our announcements and e-blasts. Thank you. In this very room, there's quite a fall for one like me. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for one like, one like me. Sorry. <laughs> And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom. For Jesus, Lord Jesus, in this very room. In this very room, there's quite enough love for all of us. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for all of us. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to change. Please be seated. 
encourage you to take out your cups. And Donald, are you going to dedicate that for us? Oh God, to those of us who have hunger, give us bread. And to those of us who have bread, give us the hunger for peace with justice. When the 5,000 were hungry, the disciples came to Jesus and said, send the people away so they may get something to eat. Yet Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. And the people reached into their pockets and pulled out bread and fish and shared. And there was an abundant food and even 12 baskets left over. Help us live out of our abundance, O oh God. Amen. Amen. So we do something around this table on World Communion Sunday that doesn't make sense. Because for the last 500 years, most Christian traditions have had different theologies when we come to this moment. The Catholics um, talk about the elements becoming the very body and blood of Christ. The Lutherans say that that um, the presence of Christ is there as a mystery in, under, and around the table, consubstantiation. Our Zwinglian uh, ancestors that influenced our UCC side of our denomination um, point out that we do this in remembrance of Jesus, which lifts up certain portions of the scriptures in which and where this sacrament gets instituted in our Calvinist history that comes through the Church of Scotland and the other part of the UCC points out that it's a mystery, the presence of Christ in these elements. And we don't have to say that they become the actual body or blood. We can just let it be a mystery. And for those of us that are influenced by any of these four traditions or the other hundreds of Christian traditions that are out there, the sadness is that we can't come to enough agreement about what this table means to actually do this with each other. And therefore, we have a World Communion Sunday where we all do communion on the same day in all of that diversity in order to just be able to do this sacrament together. That's the closest we can come. <laughs> the good part of that is it recognizes that there's diversity in all of these different Christian movements, and we don't have to agree in order for this to be meaningful for us. So when we come today, and we're doing it not just with Presbyterians and Congregationalists and Disciples of Christ, but with Lutherans and Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic and Melkite Catholic, all of the different flavors of Christians, of Pentecostals and Charismatic, when we come to this table today, the mystery is that somehow we've been inspired enough by this gospel of peace to want to do this sacrament, to find sustenance in this meal for our future. And we can hold that tension that we don't have to agree with each other to belong. We don't have to have it right to come to an open table that allows us to find God here in whatever way you need today. So this isn't a Presbyterian table or a Congregationalist table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all who want to participate can grab one of these little cups. And as we do so safely, still during um, this latest bout of COVID, and we take off one or, or both parts of the different plastic to prepare ourselves for this moment, but it's in the words of institution that we recognize the same words and what they mean to us as followers of Jesus of Nazareth. I love this quote from Rachel Held Evans. This is what God's kingdom is like. A bunch of outcasts and oddballs gathered at a table, not because they are rich or worthy or good, but because they are hungry, because they said yes. 
and there's always room for more. Brother, on the night of his arrest, as he shared a meal with his friends, Jesus took bread. He took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to his followers, saying, Share this bread among you. This is my body, broken for justice. Do this to remember me. And all together we say, the bread of life for all who hunger. And when supper was over, he took a cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, share this wine among you. This is my love shed for a better world. Do this to remember me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be nourished. God of love, spirit of compassion, bless us and this bread and wine. May this meal be food and drink for our journey, renewing, strengthening, and sustaining us. The cup of compassion for, for a broken, broken world. world. Amen. I will take the cup of freedom and call on the name of God. I will take the cup of freedom and call on the name of God. I will take the cup of freedom and call on the name of God. I will take the cup of freedom and call on the name of God. And let us pray together. God of love, we give you thanks for satisfying our hungry hearts with this meal. Send us from here to reveal your love in the world. Inspire in us the resolve and the courage, the compassion and the passion to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Amen. Let us stand for a closing song. Let us talents and tongues employ Reaching out with a shout of joy, bread is broken, the wine is poured, Christ is spoken and seen and heard, Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, half the water and those abound, Christ is able to make us one, at the table he sets the tone. Teaching people to live to bless, love in word and in deed express. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, past the water of a close of pound. Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt. Gives us love to tell, bread to share. God, Emmanuel, everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, past the world of the hopes of We affirm that we are part of a wonderfully mysterious universe that all life is interrelated in one vast web, that our role lies in nurturing all life and the planet itself, that human beings are genetically one family and of equal value, 
that every human being has the right to the basic necessities of life, that each of us is on an evolving spiritual journey, and that we are called to work to create a world of justice and peace, compassion and respect. Thank you for joining me and sending each other forth with these words. Peace in our shoes. Something to think about, but also the words we share each and every Sunday in our worship service. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. As we depart in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Can't drive, can't breathe, I can't breathe again.